Hi all, I have another absolutely amazing game to show you. This is Leela against Nemorino in TSEC Season 13, Division 3, Round 25. The set opening moves, Leela playing black, are given starts here, it's up to C6, so this is the book moves given. Slav defense, C4, Knight F6, Knight C3, E6, Bishop G5, Leela plays H6, which is actually the top book move in chess-based live book. It's like she knows the theory of out. Uh, being officially taught it. Bishop takes f6, queen takes e3, knight d7, bishop d3, and this is all still very well trodden. d takes, bishop takes, and even here g6. This is uh, a very good use of the bishop to just fianchetto it here. White castles, bishop g7, e4, e5, d5, and now black castles. This is a bit of a change, slight change, from the most popular, slightly more popular, knight b6. This position is thought to be uh, equal. So, okay. It has been seen before, though, black casting. h3. This is slightly less usual than rook c1. Uh, so, for example, this continuation has been seen before with it's an even position. Okay. Uh, but it does change the nature of the position significantly, the structure here. Uh, let's have a look at the game structure after h3. We have knight b6, bishop b3, a5. This is very, very interesting. Uh, if we look at an alternative here, rook d8 has actually been seen before. This position has been seen before, and it's thought to be about equal. So uh, a5, rook e1. H5, which makes way for bishop h6, actually. That bishop, which is black's trump cards in the position, white well, hasn't got a counterpart bishop, can use this diagonal. We have rook e3, which you might think looks a little bit weird, but if it can go to d3, if it's nudged, it will go to d3. So it's not actually nudged here. We have actually bishop d7. Uh, just in case you're wondering about aggressive intents like g5, this has its liabilities here. For example, d takes, uh, knight h2 hits h5, and say so white has to protect, then rook d3. And this is actually very pleasant for white here. So I'm not sure g5 is working, <laughs> uh, just in case you're wondering. Bishop d7, we have rook d3. Now, really interesting, c5, and this is a really fun pawn structure and idea behind it. Uh, we have knight d2, which seems very logical. White securing the c4 square. a4. Is this pawn going to be a liability? At the moment, it's protected by bishop, knight, and rook. But, yeah, things can change. Now here, uh, this move hitting the queen. If the bishop had gone to c4, in fact, black can force matters with knight takes and then b5. And then, for example, b4. And here, for example, bishop b5. And here, bishop h6 is nasty. You've got this crossfire of the bishops. And for example, this position could be really unpleasant after c4, threatening things like c3. And if white sacked the exchange, white would end up probably being uh, worse, a little bit worse. Okay, so uh, it's interesting, yeah. <laughs> so um, we have actually... Uh, this insertion rook f3 though, and now the bishop actually goes after queen d8, bishop goes to c2. And now, this is really incredible actually, after c4, this is as though the, are one of these pawns weak? We have this retreat, which during the live stream I thought was to do with rook a3, but in fact, rook c3 is more to the point. That is the bigger target. The bishop, knight, rook hold a4, it's a c4, which is that overextended or not? We have now, a uh, very interesting move indeed. <laughs> before before showing you that, uh, I mean, I thought it was it would be great if Black could get a knight to d6, but I just didn't see how in this position. So because I thought it'd be kind of Nimzovician, and then f5, you know, blockading d the d pawn, and then carrying on with things like f5, I thought would be be nice, but I didn't see how to achieve that. Um, now as an alternative to doing it the game situation. Let me just show you this, h4, to show you the dangers around c4. Rook c3, rook c8, knight a3, you see it can be gained up on. And if bishop h6, queen e2, just keeping the tension for taking that comfortably. And here, 
uh, this is just a very comfortable position it seems for white. So this is this is the problem of the C4 pawn. So guess what Lila plays though in this position which I think is wonderful, super dynamic and is a tribute really to Lila's very very exciting aggressive play, black to play. What would you play? Five seconds. I love this move. Knight c8. It just achieves what I wanted to achieve, which is a kind of visually crushing position at the cost of a pawn. Just sack the pawn. After knight takes, we have b5 kicking the knight away, so that now we can have knight d6. Nimzovich will be proud of this knight on d6, and it's functional. It's not just pretty, functional and pretty, because it holds b5 up, supports f5, and you might think, well, f5 is doomed, isn't it, because of the h5 pawn on any takes? And actually, not necessarily so. Because actually black can prove pressure on f2 and that also just taking here there's potential for e4 that's the point this knight is really functional on both sides of the board we have the move a3 here maybe there's a slight concern also about black pushing through with b4 um, so a3 queen b6 though starts to put the pressure down the f on f2 rook c3 and now f5 and the beautiful thing here, which to, to, uh, which really justifies this, uh, is that actually this is this is pretty unusual. I I, I think the, the idea, but you see the rook and queen are coordinating on f two. Maybe it's not that unusual, but um, white played queen e two, which seems solid. But uh, you might be thinking, well, why not test this whole thing with h five? You know, after e takes f five, black can play a very, very strong move in this position, which as I say, it's this knight, it's not just pretty, it's functional. Uh, echoes what I was saying earlier, this this move here, can you see what black can play with advantage? Okay, it's actually the quite the strongest move, seems to be the quiet rook e8. Just that temporary pawn set, just to push through of e4. Whatever white does here, white seems to be worse. The worst white does is losing f2 of check. As an example, because then e4 and then e3, this is just horrible, like devastation. But have a look at this position here. So the knight's really supporting e4. If we don't do uh, a silly move like uh, f takes g for a moment, uh, let's do rook e3. Then we see e4, the power of e4. And you might think, well, hang on, this just loses a pawn. Well, actually, or it's going to just knight takes f5 and we see the power of the queen pinning the pawn there knight g3 <clears throat> and if rook takes then there's queen takes f2 check better for black so what does what does white do here if knight f3 that just loses the exchange and loses that pawn that's going to be better so this whole concept of the beautiful knight on d6 is really functional in subtle uh, respects so we see queen e2 Game on. Rook f6, as though black wants to double the rooks. Now, here actually, uh, queen e3 is played. If we have a look at this position, uh, it's it's very, very interesting. If knight f1, then maybe b4 is strong. Uh, this position is is okay. Well, it's got a lot of pressure on the f file, but a small edge there. So we see actually here uh, Queen E3 offering the exchange of queens. And Lina actually just takes that and you might think, well, the fun's gone a bit with the queens off. Uh, White took with the rook. We have bishop h6, the rook goes back. Rook c8, but now you'll notice that there's an awkwardness of white pieces. Bishop d3. Uh, white's not that easy to develop here. The knight can't move without losing the knight on d2. So we have a nice, powerful retreat of this rook, actually. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Uh, we have f3. If you uh, are wondering about some aspects of this position, why f3 is needed. If we look at knight f1, f takes, you can see that if any time the black rook comes to c1, that's just horrible. It's just winning for black. After takes rook bishop f5 is nasty pin on on b1 that can't be allowed. So f3 trying to hold up things. 
Now bishop g5, very interesting, versatile looking move. The bishop might even come to d8 to b6 later, or it might attack on uh, h4. It's got a lot of possibilities. We have rook d1, which gives the bishop e3 now. Yeah, it seems to be a really uh, tough position in any case here. Uh, a lot of pressure. So yeah, just allowing this check. And now bishop d4. This is wonderful. It's like the knights are being really dominated here. And in fact, white gets a bit desperate and counter sacrifices a pawn. The pressure is really felt here. White uh, counter sacks with knight c3. If we look at a passive move for a moment, this thing is really unpalatable. Knight f5, and there's nasty like, things like knight e3. Knight e3. White would have to give up the exchange, otherwise, that's winning the exchange anyway. So that's too nasty to, to bear. So we see knight c3. White's willing to give back a pawn. Uh, King e2 protecting the bishop. And now black dominates that c file. So black has regained with interest now. Rook db1. But you know, this is still solid. The knight is holding up b5 here. And black's potentially got a 2 to 1. Uh, black, black has a 2 to 1 pawn majority. But imagine if a3 is lost later. King f7 h4. Now this seems to be asking for a dislocation. We have f4 and now this pawn is a target with g5 later. In fact now g5, g king g6, black is improving the position. Uh, king takes g5. It seems as though you know black's really outplaying. Leader's really outplaying positionally. Uh, this might even be stronger than h4. On h4 as an example, knight b1, this position uh, might not be as convincing actually with the pawn committed there, but still good for black. But we see king takes g5, knight b1, rook c1, uh, knight d2. One thing to note, you know, any, any h4 sometimes, maybe the king's even going to use h4 to get into the position. We've seen that in leader game, so there's flexibility here at the moment. But actually, the king goes in a different direction now, king f6. Uh, maybe it seems that there's good technical moves like uh, rook eight c three available. For example, this position is very nice for black. Uh, so king f six, king f two, and the king goes back to e seven actually. Uh, again, you know, rook eight c three seems to be a, a strong idea as well. Rook c two. So what's Leela's idea? Well, she takes. And hits the a3 pawn. If this goes, then there's two connected pass pawns without any resistance. Uh, rook c3 protecting that pawn for dear life. h4 locking down any g3. So the king's over here. You might wonder why. Bishop f1. Uh, yeah, it's black. I mean, if white can't afford to move the rooks, a3 will be dropped. So we have here king d8 closing the entry point c7 for a moment. And here a wonderful move revealing a really vicious plan. Knight b7 with the idea knight a5 sometimes to b3 to try and surround the a3 pawn. And uh, yeah, it's it's getting really nasty. We have knight f1, which seems to just encourage that really now even more. Uh here, if bishop c2 after this check, b4. Knight d6, the knight can actually come to d6. This position is pretty nasty after h3. There's some destruction of white's king position. And black could end up winning material, for example, like this with winning position. So uh, we have actually king g1. But now knight a5, yeah, with knight b3 intent. Knight h2. So white's plan here with this knight rerouting is to hit e5. But after knight b3, knight g4. Leader plays, I believe, the strongest possible continuation. I was a bit concerned myself about e5 dropping, and maybe bishop takes g4 needed. Bishop takes g4, although tempting. It was this. This is only enough for. Yeah, there is a big advantage actually with this as well, because actually black can play this. The bishop's overloaded on e2 if the knight's ever on d4. We can see that knight e2 check wins the rook. So if this is really the case, black could end up winning a piece and have a big advantage. So that, that is strong as well. Bishop takes g4, but this is really nice. 
this continuation, rook takes a3, encouraging white to take on e5. After check, then forcibly getting rid of the rooks. Uh, white doesn't want to go into a self pin here. And this thing's like knight d4 anyway, if bishop c2. So we have the rooks coming off, which leaves the two connected pass pawns. A familiar theme. Leader is fantastic with the pass pawns. Bishop b1, a3. It's pretty lost here. b4, king d2. We have check. And now knight d4. This this leaves a lot of the tension in the pawns, but also there's bishop b5 to f1 to think about. Hitting g2, which is used now. <laughs> check. And here, after knight e5, the game was ended. It's in white, in in black's favour. Clearly black's totally winning this. Uh, so it's like plus 6.5 for both engines for the last eight ply or half moves. So that's where it gets adjudicated as a win. A game continuation, for example, king d6, king c7. We have, for example, bishop c4, taking you know, taking out d5. And this is just hopeless. The pass pawns just win. Uh, black's queening, basically. It doesn't matter if this happens. Black's queening or totally winning position. So that was really staggering dynamic chess. In fact, Leela showed in this type of position the power of the knight on d6. Nimzovich would be so proud. It's really Nimzovician ideals in a practical sense, it seems. The knight on d6 was really quite functional, though. There's no point in having a pretty blockading knight without understanding some of the implications uh, concretely, like supporting f5 because of this subtle rook e8 for e4. The knight's stretching out to support e4, which breaks down diagonals and stuff. So a very, very fascinating, instructive game. A very, very enjoyable to watch. Everyone was thrilled watching this with good reason. Hope you were too here. Comments, questions, likes, shares appreciated. Thanks so much.